Hey there, and welcome back to this episode of the Onco PT Podcast. Now, good news for us is over the past several decades, we've seen a tremendous increase in the amount of cancer survivors and people living months to years to decades after their cancer diagnosis, which is incredible. However, this is not a trend that we see across the board. In fact, there are several patient populations that we are not seeing the same increase in survivorship like we see in most of our white patients. And this is just one of the reasons why that DEI and inclusion and diversity, equity, and belonging really involves and is, is so necessary to be included within oncology care. And so I've invited expert Dr. Patrick Ford to come onto the OncoPT podcast today to talk a little bit about his platform and how we can be more inclusive clinicians. So Pat, welcome to the OncoPT podcast. It's great to be here. I know we've kind of been talking, chatting back and forth, and I'm glad that I get to be on this platform with you, such a great host. And I've talked to other people that listen to this podcast and love it. So I'm really happy to, to be here with you. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Pat. That makes me so happy. <laughs> so you have your own thriving platform on Instagram, which is where we originally got connected. So could you tell us a little bit about what is your platform and then just go ahead and drop your Instagram handle while we're at it too. Yeah. So everything that happens uh, marketing wise and, and visually happens through Instagram. My handle is the inclusive clinician. Um, you can find me on Instagram mostly, or you could send me an email uh, patford.tpt at gmail. Um, and I just talk about everything related to anti-racism and DEIB and all of that related to healthcare and physical therapy and all allied health professionals. When you got in, well, let me even back up. How did you know that you wanted to be a physical therapist? And then we're going to kind of progress through the years. Yeah, this is... I tell the story sometimes with the knowledge that part of me was a little bit of ego mixed into it, right? I, like many other people who got into PT school, had the story of being an injured athlete for multiple years and going through PT and all that stuff. But most people had a great experience with their PT and they're like, oh, my PT was so awesome. I want to do that too. I had persistent knee pain despite going to PT and it not working for me. And I thought that it should work. I was like, I know there's something about this that should make my knees feel better. There's no scans that revealed meniscus tears or cartilage problems or breaks or fractures or whatever. Um, but I was like, the quality of PT I'm getting just isn't up to par with what I need for my knees to get better. And I literally had knee pain every time I ran for 10 years. So part of my inspiration to become a PT was I was really curious about it. And I thought I could make my knees better despite the PTs not being able to do it. So part of my inspiration for, for being a PT was one, I wanted to help people by some means. I was really curious about science and anatomy and exercise and personal training, stuff like that. And I thought that was the best route to, to kind of fuse all of those passions together. So then you're in PT school, you obviously graduate PT school. Where did you start practicing like setting wise when you first got into PT? Yeah. So throughout PT school, I knew that I wanted to be outpatient orthopedics sports, maybe, um, I did almost all of my rotation with orthopedics and I went straight into orthopedic outpatient setting, uh, private practice, PT owned business here in Des Moines, Iowa. And I worked with that company for four and a half years or so. So I have my OCS. I went straight into remote residency while I was working full time and have been kind of just loving orthopedic physical therapy outpatient. At what point then did you decide that you wanted to get into DEIB work? Because this is something that I think is really interesting. I think there's a lot of people who are now considering like, oh, you know what? I'm going to go into PT after I graduate school and I'm going to be a PT practicing for the rest of my life. 
And that's great, but there's also a lot of other ways that we can be really invested and improve our profession. And I think you have a really, really cool way that you're doing it. Yeah, I I honestly never thought this would be a route for me. I never thought I was going to be in this area of work, educating PTs about DEIB and anti-racism or anti-racism and other healthcare professionals. Um, through PT school, I knew I wanted my career to be more than PT. Um, I'm really into CrossFit, so I wanted to coach CrossFit, maybe do some personal training on the side, like anything. I have a lot of interest um, that I wanted to pursue, but I wanted PT to be the backbone of that. Um, my racial ethnicity um, and identity is black and white biracial. So on my mom's side, I'm white. On my dad's side, I'm black. And that has shaped my experience my whole life. And I feel like that became more present for me, this conversation about my own identity, me internally kind of searching for what it is and who I am, and the external, the culture, the society, and conversations that were happening around me. So not just internally, but externally as well, and feeling a lot of that pressure, but still is just something that I dealt with throughout PT school. Fast forward to 2020, just like many other people, a microscope was on George Floyd and police brutality. Um, in the CrossFit world, CrossFit was under a microscope for um, some of the things that the prior CEO had said, some of the things that they'd seen at administration and throughout the community. And my whole world was really hyper-focused on race, racism, systemic oppression and everything that that involves. And up to this point, you know, I, I had spoken out about some of these things, mostly in closer circles with friends or family. But now that I felt like I identified more with George Floyd and other victims of police brutality who are black and black bodies, I felt a sense of guilt for not truly standing up for what I believed in, that the impact that I was making by speaking out with friends or family or whatever wasn't really making a difference. And I wasn't fully embodying the values that I said that I had. Essentially, it was like a um, dissonance that I had, that I believed in one thing, but I wasn't showing up that way with my actions. Um, and I wasn't aligning my, my values with my actions. So that was really the spark for me to start learning about this stuff more. And I could go as deep into this, this story as you need me to go. Let me ask this question, because I think this is going to keep going deeper into your story. So you felt this dissonance. And I think the easy answer is to recognize the dissonance or maybe ignore it altogether, but like to recognize the dissonance and say, okay, I'm feeling a certain way, but I'm just going to keep going with what I've been doing, what I've been feeling, because that's what I know. That's what's comfortable for me. Right. But you didn't. And you lent, you leaned, lent is not a real word in this case. You leaned further into that, that dissonance, maybe discomfort. I, I'm not sure what words you would use to describe here. I'm going to defer to you on that, Pat. So why did you lean further into that instead of just recognizing and saying, okay, I'm, I'm done with this feeling? That's a good question because there's a lot of events that triggered similar thoughts within me my whole life. And I was more aware of their connection to me personally as I was 18, 19, 20 plus years old. And I think, and I'm, I don't want to make this political, but for myself, the um, the presidency of Trump and everything that was surrounding, even going into that election of 2016, all of these events added up for me and internally brought me to my tipping point in 2020 that it was like, I need to explore this thought a little bit more within myself and understand my identity, my role in all this, or 
I have to take it out of my life entirely and kind of disconnect myself from it because it was causing me so much turmoil emotionally and even for my family. Um, like at the time I was depressed, I wasn't showing up at work in the way that I typically do. I wasn't providing the best care that I could have. Um, and it was just like, I, I need to let this go or I need to dive into it and understand it. And really all of that led into not necessarily me wanting to be super educated about DEI and had anti-racism, police brutality was like, my first reaction was I need more people that I can talk to people that look like me that are in this profession that are in my area that I can talk to that share a similar perspective to me that can kind of just give me a little bit of guidance or at least feel a feeling of community that I necessarily didn't get with my wife who is white or even my siblings who are biracial. Like I, I just need somebody in the space who I could identify with. So really my first actions were selfish that I, I just needed more community, community around me. Um, so that's what I started to do was really to look up other PTs who were black or brown in Iowa specifically that I could start just talking about this stuff with. Just be like, hey, how, how are you doing? How is everything going? Like, what is your experience with this, that, and the other? Um, other people that I could talk to. And out of looking up, and I, I personally had to kind of sift through hundreds of clinicians, I didn't find anybody in my first wave of researching clinicians in Iowa. Mm -hmm. No Black clinicians, one person of color, um, that was in the state, but that was in the entire state. And that pushed yeah. me even further to be like, okay, I need to, I am the representation of black physical therapists in Iowa. And I need to understand this deeper. And that led me into learning more about health disparities and racism and healthcare and everything else. Mm -hmm. We talked about this off air just before we we hit record, but you're in Iowa and my family is very much in Iowa and it's, it's wild to me, but also, I mean, when I sit and I think about it, that unfortunately doesn't surprise me that there's not a lot of representation and this is not an Iowa specific thing. Listeners, if you're in Iowa, we're not hating on Iowa, I pinky promise, <laughs> but it's, it's very much like PT is very much, it's well documented that we have very much a representation issue that the demographics of PTs do not match that of the greater communities within the United States, right? And this was something that I saw also, um, the resource that I was looking over as I was preparing for this, um, ASCO came out, so the American Society of Clinical Oncologists, they came out a couple years ago with a kind of a statement on EDI or DEI that we've been talking about is not a one-time thing. And this is obviously an ongoing thing. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that this is something that we see not just in PT, but in oncology and healthcare in general, that we do not match, we do not mirror or represent our communities like we really need to. And there's a lot of really well-documented benefits to this. And so I feel like Patrick, and I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but I'd love to know, like, what is your feeling on being the representation in Iowa for black physical therapists? Um, it was really intense at first. Like it was very intense. I had this immense amount of pressure that I felt um, and responsibility for fostering a new wave of black and brown physical therapists in the state. I didn't even go to school in the state. I went to Creighton in Omaha, which is right on the border, but, um, mm -hmm. and I'm from Illinois. So I, my ties to, to Iowa were through my wife who I met at Iowa state and me taking my job oh, yeah. and, <laughs> um, me starting my nonprofit Project Onyx, which is based out of Des Moines. And those are my ties to Iowa. But mm -hmm. through each of these experiences, I've, I've 
grown a stronger connection to this community, more of a feeling like uh, I'm responsible for this community. So all of that mm -hmm. has kind of just resulted in me wanting to stay here and, and do that work. So less yeah. uh, of a guest burn-in now that I feel, um, more of a sense of responsibility and um, not pride, but rather just taking ownership of, you know, the role that I, that I can play um, and mm -hmm. that these young future clinicians can play on me and in my life that my interaction with them hopefully will yield that interest in these fields beyond just being interested into actually pursuing physical therapy school and health professions. Mm -hmm. At what point in your journey to find community did you say, I can't find the community, so I'm going to make the community? That was almost immediately after I figured out that I was the only PT. Okay. So it had to be all that stuff that I told you happened in a week after George Floyd was murdered. Okay. And I started doing some research on demographics of black and PTs and black healthcare providers. And I had this idea of like, okay, well, if I am the representation, then I need to do something about it. I need to foster some future professionals who look like me or come from marginalized groups, especially race, racially and ethnically. And I just need to do something about it. So I had the idea of my nonprofit Project Onyx, which focuses on giving access to mentorship, to fitness, um, basically for fitness memberships, um, and just community to young black and brown teens and young adults. So I reached out to my co-founder who I didn't know basically at all at the time and was like, Hey, you have a gym. I'm super interested in doing this. I have this idea. And he, who is Elijah Muhammad, he's a CrossFitter. You should look him up. He was on board right away. Um, so we, we started the nonprofit while I was learning some more about DEI, anti-racism, um, disparities, all of that stuff. Okay. So your nonprofit is Project Onyx, correct? That is correct. Okay. So Iowa specific question. Did you go to Iowa state? I did go to Iowa state. Okay. Then why are your colors for university of Iowa, Pat? Like what the heck, man? <laughs> that is a great question. <laughs> I would move that on to Elijah Muhammad because his gym colors are black and yellow and he <sighs> had his so gym before color. I knew him. I, I tease, so my dad went to Iowa State, my mom went to University of Iowa, so I grew up in a house divided, so when you said Iowa State, I was like, wait a minute, those are those are some Hawkeye colors right there. Luckily, we'll, we'll cue this up to like the Wu-Tang, it's a play on the Wu-Tang symbol, and the colors of the Wu-Tang symbol traditionally were black and yellow. They have a bunch of different colors, okay. but it is a play on <laughs> that design, so we'll, we'll just chalk it up to that. And I'll make sure that we actually do have one that's red and yellow. I think we have one shirt that has that. Too, so I did, you know, I, like I said, grew up in a house divided. So I, I know how the, the rivalry can get sometimes. <laughs> so when it came to the nonprofit came first and then yep. did the inclusive clinician come after that? Like, what was that journey to kind of Project Onyx to inclusive clinician work that you're doing now? So the idea for Project Onyx started in early June of 2020. We mm -hmm. technically didn't get started until the end of September to really launch our program. Mm -hmm. Throughout that time, I was learning more about demographics, which led me into learning about health disparities and social determinants of health from a anti-racist lens. So not just mm -hmm. like, what are the numbers? But like, why are the numbers? Like, why do they mm -hmm. exist in the first place? Yeah. Um, and that led me into biases of the system and the providers themselves, looking into black and brown patient perspectives of healthcare and health systems and providers. 
And I learned all this. And at the time I was finishing up my residency and proposed to my director that we should incorporate this stuff into the residency program. And he's like, you know, I, I don't have experience with this. We didn't plan on adding this in, but I know you've been learning a lot about it. So what do you think about teaching some of the residents and the mentors about this stuff? So I got the opportunity to teach some of the residents, some of the mentors about what I was learning. I put on a small presentation about it, maybe presented on it for an hour, two hours, something like that. And that presentation turned into a short form, like three hour seminar con ed course that I did a few times after that. So toward the back end of 2020, I probably did that two, three times with various groups where I had this one-time offering where I taught people about DI and anti-racism and it was fantastic, but a lot of it yielded exactly what we had mentioned before we started recording was the one-off nature of these things. That's like, oh, I'm just gonna kind of check, put a check mark next to DEI and say that I learned about it. A lot of people actually would come up to me after or send me an email and be like, how do we continue this conversation with you or Mm -hmm. continue learning about this um, afterward? So that's when I transitioned from my two, three hour seminar uh, con ed course into the eight week course that I host now. And so tell us the name of your course. So my course is called Anti-Racism and DIB for Clinicians. Um, It's for all allied health professionals. Uh, I mostly focus on physical therapists, OTs, Mm -hmm. speech language, uh, pathologists of the such, but really anybody that is in healthcare to any degree, admin, uh, CNA, whatever you might be, like I I would encourage everyone to to take the course. Mm -hmm. We're going to, of course, link to the course in the show notes, and we're going to talk about it a little more at the end of the episode. But through the course that you've been teaching for the past couple years, Pat, what do you feel like has been the biggest takeaway for clinicians who, who came in and were like, I've heard about this course, I've heard it's great, because everything I see online is like, this course is amazing, who are maybe like uncertain, because I feel like during 2020, and particularly 2020, it was just such a traumatic year in general for so many reasons. I feel like DEI really was a checkbox. Like we got an email when I was working for my corporate previous PT position. We got one email in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. And it was very much like, we're not going to talk about this at work. End of discussion. And the like uproar that came up in response to that email, rightfully so, was like, um, that's not okay. That's not right. And so they kind of fumbled an apology, but that was it, right? They acknowledged it once in email and they kind of said like, okay, check, we have, we have done our DEI, like we're good to go. And I think that was the experience of a lot of clinicians too, especially who are in a corporate setting. So what I'm asking is what is the takeaway that you think clinicians who take your course are like, oh my God, this is like, this is what I have learned. Yeah, I, I think it's a few things. I really designed the course to reflect the process that I went through as I was learning about this stuff. It's literally like the exact stuff that I learned about mm-hmm. packaged in a way that is consumable without a lot of the detriment to mental and social, emotional issues that I had to go through to attain and process all this on my own was that now I can make a community where people can process it together and come up with solutions or come up with strategies of their own reflection on their relationship to these issues. Um, One of the things that you had mentioned to me was learning about like the misconceptions that PTs have. And one, one of the biggest ones is that these things, DEI anti-racism only comes down to usually a few issues. One is 
how do I address racist comments or um, non-PC comments made by a client or a coworker or whatever? Like, how do I have that conversation? Very important. I think it's a skill that everybody should have, um, but I think it is a misconception of like what all of this entails is like learning how to talk about it, learning how to say the right thing, learning how to feel like you know what you're talking about. Um, another misconception is that it is political, that people believe that just by learning about DEI or by bringing up discussions about it, you are bringing up something that is political. Yes, I think there's political tones to it. I think it has been politicized, but I think these are issues that affect so many different groups of people that being able to talk about it is a human thing. Like it is issues that humans just go through no matter what your political affiliation is. There are people from these oppressed groups that exist on the political spectrum which makes it apolitical in my mind that it is something that that needs to be discussed um, in a way that really brings people into the conversation. I don't think it's always going to be conflict free. I don't think it's always going to feel like it's constructive, but the presence of the conversation is better than just pushing it to the background and saying, this isn't our realm. We don't talk about this stuff just like you experienced, like I've experienced. Um, and I think the main takeaways from this course are the converse to those things mm -hmm. that I think it is, okay, I have these strategies of how to talk about these things. I've learned that this is something that affects a lot of different people. I learned the way that it affects and the exact mechanisms that led to these results, whether it be disparities or lack of representation or whatever it might be. But most importantly, I think people enjoy having community to talk to, learning more about themselves in the process that people lose the really understanding of how to communicate with themselves and reflect on their own experiences. A lot of people will sum it up to their upbringing, like, oh, I had racist or homophobic or whatever grandparents or parents or whatever and like i i don't want to dismiss that experience but i do want to recognize like we need to think about ourselves and our own relationship to these things rather than deferring blame to other people because we can't control circumstances that we've already been through we can recognize them and attribute some of that experience of how we processed it to those peoples and those people in that experience, but it's been perpetuated within you, whether you like it or not. And your role is to try and understand that either through guidance of having community and having somebody like me or somebody else help work that work through that with you or through your own self-discovery that I had to go through largely, but I wanted a community. That's why I started this. It's so many reasons is like, I wanted other people that I could talk to about these issues so that I can expose myself to other perspectives and experiences and really get a sense of where is PT when it comes to this stuff. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I saw other PTs talking about your course was that this, you know, and you've alluded to this multiple times, Pat, about the importance of community. And so many of the continuing education courses that like are available these days, it is a one off thing, kind of like we talked about a lot of companies and corporations responses to 2020. And like the emergence of DEI is like, this is something we have to talk about right now was like, I have checked the box. I have cross that off my to-do list, like it's taken care of. And when we bring community into this, it offers, I think, a really great opportunity to have ongoing conversations and to actually take what you've learned back with you to your practice, but then also have a safe and curated space where you can, con where you can continue to learn more, 
to further your own understanding. But then I really like what you said, Pat, about getting to know yourself, like getting to know myself more as I'm working to actually implement that, because that's something that you offer with your courses is that community, right? Yeah, exactly. Like a big part of just kind of in general, even if you take DEI out of it, is most of them you attend some weekend thing for like two days, three days, you get some type of pamphlet or packet and you're kind of just left at your devices after that is over. Mm -hmm. yep. Fine. That works for a lot of people. That works really well in a lot of circumstances. Some have even gone as far as having multi week online courses where you're part of a Facebook group and you can kind of communicate through the Facebook group, but really your time to have the discussion is still sequestered to that time frame, the eight weeks that you're in the course. Um, but I wanted to do something different with my course where if you're part of the community, second that you join, you're in the community. Like you are part of it forever. I have a Discord server where we can have asynchronous conversation on anything that we need to talk about when it relates to anti-racism, racism, and healthcare, DIB, whatever it might be. Um, and even after you get through the eight-week course, if we're having a live session this week, on um, Thursday, whatever, you can attend the live session. If there's a conversation that's happening in the Discord, my hopes is that you as a previous learner already have experience with this stuff. And it might be something I have no idea about. When somebody comes to the community and is Onco specialized or interested in Onco, but need somebody that has more experience in that space, I'm going to be like, Elise is already in the community. Like, let's cue her into this chat. Like, she's already been to the course and she's implemented this stuff. Like, maybe it's a policy change or has just learned more about herself and her relation to this clientele base and this patient population. Let's key her in. So we could bring professionals from different realms that have more knowledge than I do about that. Um, that can give guidance, can participate in the conversations, and it's lifelong. So now we can continue to have a growing community that maybe gets further specialized where it is a inpatient-based community where we mm -hmm. talk about inpatient problems only. It is university-based. We only talk about colleges, universities, PT programs, whatever it might be. We're not at that point yet, but that open forum type of knowledge acquisition um, and utilizing the community to get that, I think is something that is unique to my course. And I think is at the, the core of making DEI a permanent thing rather than isolated in moments and times of different people's lives. Yeah. It's almost mind boggling that nobody's thought to do this community aspect previously because it just makes so much sense. And I think it makes like a true, a true implementation into practice so much more feasible. I mean, Pat, how many like weekend conferences have you got, like, you know, courses have you gone to that you sit in a classroom or therapy office, fluorescent lights, indoor, eight to five, Saturday and Sunday, and then you get back to work on Monday and then you've forgotten half the stuff and you don't know how to actually implement it into practice. I mean, that is my struggle with continuing ed courses. And I feel like this solves such a need of like, A, how do we communicate and teach and implement DEI, but then also equip the clinician to continue doing this work when you get back to your clinic, not just that Monday, but in the weeks to months to years afterwards. And I think that's so powerful. Yeah. And like to add on to that, if situation pops up, like I go through my weekend course and I am trying to implement it even the next week and I'm like, I'm not getting it. Like, who do I go to in those circumstances? Maybe I reached out to the person, um, but that's always hard to do. You kind of feel responsible for yourself to like, okay, well, I'll just look through my pamphlet and kind of scroll to the part where I'm trying to learn about it. Instead being like, 
I ran into somebody that used an N slur in front of me and I didn't know what to do. I'm feeling bad about myself because I went through this course. I learned out how to communicate. I was feeling confident. But when it came up to doing the task, performing the task, I didn't perform. Who do we go to when we have those issues? Not only to be like, what should I have said? But like, how do I deal with the feeling of shame and guilt of not speaking up? Like there's, there's so much more to the community than just being a lifelong learner. It's like, oh, I have other people that I can rely on that I've probably felt this way because I can tell you right now, almost every single person, if not every single person has experienced a moment where somebody said something that made them feel uncomfortable, that made them feel like they should say something, but they didn't. And then later on, they said, why didn't I say something? Why didn't I stand up to this person? Oh, this person didn't mean that. They didn't mean this. Their intentions were good. They didn't say that or they didn't say it this way. And then they justify it to themselves. They have that internal monologue and then they kind of move on. Just like we were talking about earlier with like the crux of like my pinnacle for change to tip me over the edges. I could have had that conversation to bring me back down and to, to have that. But instead I can now be like, hey, this person said this thing. I feel all sorts of ways about it. I was hoping that we can have a conversation. We could bring it up in the live call that week and talk about it in the group. We could talk about it in the discord, whatever it might be. I think that's the key to making change. And this is just the last thing I want to say about that was yeah. it's not a just about how do I take these skills into the clinic and apply them into the clinic. It's about being able to take these skills and applying them to life. If you want to raise children who are inclusive and view everybody as equals, but are able to recognize the struggles that different groups of people go through, this is the type of course that you need to take. If you want to be able to confront your racist relatives or friends or whatever it might be, this is the course that you need to take to start acquiring those skills. Mm -hmm. If you want to confront it within yourself of, I've had had explicit biases about these issues. I've had these thoughts. I grew up this way. If you want to start confronting those things, this is the group. And even if you're not sure if you want to confront those things, but want to open up the door to possibility of that, this is the group. This is the course to take. So for a lot of people, they think it is a commitment to being a ally or um, an activist or whatever it might be, whatever name you might label it. But it's not that. It's like, I was neglected this information for so long. I need to open myself to learning more about it. Mm -hmm. Two of your posts that you did recently on Instagram come immediately to mind. So you had a post, I think it was like June one or something that was like, you don't have to be a full-time activist to make good things happen. I'm, I'm very much summarizing, right? So this is, you know, it's, it's something that is very much attainable for the general clinician listening right now. Who's like, Elise, this sounds amazing, but I'm not in charge, right? I'm not like the clinic manager or I'm not the director of rehab at my facility. Like I'm just a clinician. What can I do about this? And this is exactly what Pat has been talking about of like, it's an ongoing journey. There, there's not like a, a, destination we're trying to reach. We're just trying to drag as many people along lovingly as we can in this process and make healthcare period more inclusive and welcoming to all individuals. So first post was don't have to be a full-time ally, but then the next post that immediately just like triggered in my brain, Pat, was you had a post the other day that was about having like separate lives are separate or keeping your like your PT life separate from your personal life. And that was something I used to, especially when I was newer to being a PT, I was like, okay, I'm going to keep like personal life over here and PT life over there. And like, we're humans, the bleed over is there. And it, it makes so much sense what you're talking about of like, this, this, this concept, these, these concepts of being a more inclusive welcoming 
clinician to make an, a therapeutic environment more like make people feel belonging like they belong in this area that doesn't just limit itself to our PT clinics or facilities right like this extends outwards in our in our families in our neighborhoods in our communities and I feel like that's a really great place to start with all of this like as a clinician that is a great place to start small but see the ripple effects move out from all of this. And so I'd like to kind of wrap up this conversation, Patrick, with as a clinician who is listening to this podcast right now, who does not own their own practice, who is not in leadership, who is not in management, maybe they're newer to practice and they're saying, I know this is important. I know that I want to be a part of this, but I don't know how. What are some action steps that they can implement today to get started? Yeah, the first that I would recommend is honestly doing what you did. Like we didn't know each other. You kind of go through somebody's Instagram, you look at their page, you see what they're about, you watch some of their reels or whatever, and you start to learn more about it. And I think that's that's a big step of like, take your time, go to my page if you want the inclusive clinician on instagram and scroll through some of the posts if it feels like it does resonate with you to some degree even a small percentage it's worth exploring a little bit more mm -hmm. because it's not typically something that we dive into it's something that typically makes us feel uncomfortable and um we lack confidence when we approach this type of stuff and it makes us retreat back into ourselves where it is comfortable we have that internal monologue. We have that dialogue with ourselves that tells us and convince us that it, as long as we keep appreciating everyone and treating everybody equally, like we are doing what we need to do. Yes, that's fantastic. It's great when you think of it on that level. But when there's a gap in our knowledge as PTs, I feel like it is our responsibility to explore that gap. Because whether you're an onco PT, a public health PT, an orthopedic PT, if somebody comes to you and says, I have this issue, I'm also going through chemotherapy, is your responsibility to be like, I don't know that answer, if you don't know the answer, but I will look it up and try to learn more so I can fill that gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. DEI applies to every realm of PT. Anti-racism applies to every realm of PT. So when you encounter somebody who has a different lived experience based on the race or ethnicity than your own, then it's your job to build cultural humility, education about that community, about that individual, to really fill those gaps for yourself and to explore what that means for you and yourself as well. So first thing, go to my page. I'm just rambling on. Go to my page, look through some of the posts. If you have any questions about any of that stuff, it connects with you. You could leave a comment. You could DM me um, and we'll have that conversation. If you feel like you're ready now, right now, you could go to my website and sign up for the course right at this moment. Can you please share the website where people can find you in your course? Yeah, it's the exact same as my Instagram, theinclusiveclinician.com. You can go on to my course see what's going on on there, uh, find a date that works for you. The next one that we'll have coming up um, at this date, when this drops, is going to be the September cohort. I believe it's starting September 24th, mm -hmm. which is a Sunday, and it lasts for eight weeks. I feel like I've kept you talking for a really long time, Patrick. I feel like I'm the reason your voice is like, ah. But yeah, you... I... Patrick, I really appreciate the time that you, first of all, put into your platform because it's tremendous and just consistently high quality information that you're putting out that makes DEIB feel a little more within reach, especially for this big, crazy world that we live in. Like it's so down to earth. It's so easily understood. And the, even though that's not your private community, the community 
I see within the comments on each of your posts is really, really incredible. And so if that's what's happening publicly, I can't even imagine the caliber of dialogue that's happening on your private community for your core students. And it's definitely something that I want to get plugged into. And I would really encourage the listeners today, like, this is going to be amazing. You've definitely got to check this out. So again, you can visit Patrick's website, uh, theinclusiveclinician.com. I almost said my own website. That is not it. <laughs> um, and amazing course. Again, follow Pat on Instagram, The Inclusive Clinician. And again, Pat, thank you so much for coming on today. I really, really appreciate you and your time. Yeah, I was really happy to do this and it was a great conversation. Thank you.